designated issue one, getting involved, establishing shot. We visit the planet seven, Alpha seven in the Dora system. Two moons orbit around the planet, along with a green sun. From space, it seems like a serene body of life, but a raging battle between the peaceful Forlans and the warlike Geronians has torn it apart. On the planet, we visit an old alien castle. From the looks of it, the surrounding area has just seen a great battle. Lots of destroyed ships, tanks, and smoldering ash cover the area. The castle itself has worn, but has no battle damage. Inside the throne room, King Tesson is standing on the throne room's balcony, surveying the damage. Although he may not look his age, the king is over 400 years old. The grand entrance doors and rooms open as Futok, the king advisor, rushes in. Your Majesty, I've just received information that the Geroniums are planning another attack. Calm yourself, Futok. We will repel this attack just as we have done with all the others. But the reports say this attack will have the full force of the entire army. Can we withstand such an attack? There's more. King Brigan himself will be leading the attack. That's insane. Why would he... Sire. <sighs> Summon the designated. Have them meet me in the power chamber. The king leaves Futak standing in the throne room by himself. I fear the worst. A few minutes later, inside the power chamber, which has three floors, a different color light on each floor, a transport chamber, and a power core. Forlorn scientists, the king, and well-armed elite soldiers gather around a light chamber with three tubes in it. Five soldiers stand at attention, and behind the king and the head scientist, Futak, is there too. As you requested, sire, we've prepared to remove the star fragment from the power core, but I must implore you to... Remove it! But sire, removing our newest and best power source at a time like this... Silence! Is... These fragments are not just a new power source. They are, in fact, much more. Yes, but we have just only begun our research. Taking away such a find as... Remove the fragments! The head scientist presses some buttons on a nearby panel. Access granted. The tube then starts to descend into the ground. There's some smoke surrounding the center tube, and when it clears, we see a metal staff that holds the five star fragments in place. They're about the size of diamonds you see in an expensive engagement ring. The king, who is visibly upset, turns towards the head scientist. Where is the sixth piece? Cut to the insurance lab, the Forlan lab. We see a room full of brutish Geronians standing over a dead Forlan scientist. A transport portal is behind them in the research room. There is one remaining scientist that gives the King Brigham and the Geronians the sixth fragment. The King has an overpowering presence. The King nods to one of his men, who then kills the last Forlan scientist. Back in the power chamber, King Tesson turns towards the five members near him. You, my designated, are entrusted with the safekeeping of these star fragments. I fear that King Brigan has learned about our recent discovery and will stop at nothing to acquire it. The leader of the designated stops forward. Sire, we have yet to fail you, but even we can't withstand the full force of the Geronian army. Your mission will take you far away from the line of battle. I want you to take these fragments and hide them, so that even I will not know their location. Just then, the doors of the top floor of the chamber blast open. The Geronians enter the chamber, and King Brigand leads them. In his hand is the sixth fragment, glowing brightly. Destroy the generators! Kill them all and bring me those fragments! On the main floor, everybody is running everywhere. They must have found a way to penetrate our shields. The designated take the fragments right from the metal staff. You have your orders. Protect the fragments at all costs. To the Halai. King Brigham starts making his way to the main floor. The designated start to leave the chamber. Some Geronians are destroying the main computer's generator. Their defenses have fallen. Let the slaughter begin. Portals are opening up all over the entire chamber, letting in more Geronians. At the same time, reinforcements for King Tesson arrive. There's lots of fighting and killing. 
the designator leaving through an unoccupied corridor, King Brigand sees them leave the chamber. Much later on planet Earth, inside a bedroom apartment, Natasha, blonde, mid-twenties, physically fit, is right in the middle of getting dressed for work. She's in a rush because she's late. The clock reads 3.47 p.m. Her open purse is laying on the bed where a name tag rests on top of it. Natasha pulls up her pants with one hand and pulls down her turtleneck sweater with the other. She is a hot mess. Damn it! I can't believe I'm late again! Now dressed, she grabs her name tag, which reads Natasha from the bed, as well as her bag, which she grabs from the bottom. All her stuff falls out of the bag. I can't get a break. Something always slows me down. I'm cursed. I know it. Oh, can I get to work for once on time in my, my life? Oh, God. Moving on to a city street. There's a hospital. There's a lot of cars and people going around their business. The only building you can see clearly is the hospital, the Ed Dial Center of Health, which takes up the whole block. Natasha's in her convertible rushing to make the green light. She's wearing her sunglasses. There are three lanes on each side of the street. Natasha is in the middle lane. A crowded bus on the same road is in the far right lane close to the intersection. And going up the cross street is a one-way road, but people in the cars have made it two lanes. A red minivan is approaching the intersection, coming towards the news crew. The reporter is standing in front of the hospital, but the camera guy is shooting her at an angle so that he can just see a bit of the intersection. They are doing a live shoot. In a few hours, Dr. Precipicus, the newest neurosurgeon to emerge in his field, will perform a new technique to remove a brain tumor in Chris Hughes, a 12-year-old boy who may not see his 13th birthday if his tumor isn't removed. Inside the minivan, we see Ed and Adam with their parents. Ed and Adam are in the back. Ed is looking out the window, which is closed. They are all dress as if going to a semi-formal affair. Well, hang on, kids. We're almost there. The gallery is just around the next corner. I can't wait for us to get a close-up view of that red diamond. Everyone who has seen it up close says it almost pulses like a heart. Look! Just then, the sky turns black. Everyone in the area looks towards the sky except Natasha, who only sees the light turn yellow and guns it to make the light. In the middle of the intersection, the portals open up. You can see the light from the portal in the now blackened skies. Natasha veers to the right to avoid the portal, nearly hitting the bus. She then veers to the left to avoid the bus and goes onto oncoming traffic. The bus nearly hitting Natasha avoids all cars waiting at the red light and plows into people walking by a fountain and people are waiting for the bus. The people in the minivan see Natasha a little too late and they hit her. Ah! <laughs> it's quite some time later. Natasha lays in a hospital bed. She is moving her head violently. No! Look out! Natasha wakes up to see Dr. Precipicus standing above her. Relax. We thought we had lost you, but you're fine now. Natasha, in her hospital gown and wrapped in bandages, has tubes sticking inside her body. Her leg and arm are broken. Her head is all bandaged up, but you can still see her face. What happened? Where am I? You were involved in a massive collision outside the hospital. I'm Dr. Precipicus. I have been taking care of you. Ugh, you mean an accident? All I remember is this light. I tried to avoid it, but... Don't worry about that right now. Just be grateful you survived. There were a lot of people involved who didn't. How many died? Just consider yourself one of the chosen few. Leaving with that, Dr. Pacificus exits the room. Natasha sees Ed, the little boy from the minivan. He waves and walks away. Natasha thinks she's dreaming and goes back to bed. Sometime later at night, Natasha is fully healed and finally dressed. She is walking down a dimly lit, deserted hospital corridor. Hello? Where is everybody? She tries all the doors, all locked. We hear the voice of Ed. This way, over here. Hello? Who said that? One door opens. In here. Natasha enters to see Ed and an unfamiliar Chris standing and waiting for Natasha to enter. Oh, you! 
I'm so sorry I killed you. Please stop haunting me. You're silly. I'm not haunting you. I just wanted to see you. And here you are. Huh? Chris walks up to Natasha. Look, I can't really explain it myself, so don't ask me to. When you wake up, come to the cancer ward. Room 530. Wake up? Yes. Wake. Natasha wakes up to find out that she is still in her hospital gown and lying on the couch in Dr. Rain's office. She only has a small scar below her hairline. The doctor is sitting on a stool next to her. What did you learn? Nothing, I have to admit. Once you went under hypnosis, you didn't respond to any of my questions. It's possible that you're having stress-related issues surrounding the accident. Since you didn't have any problems sleeping, I think you'll be fine. I'll draw up the release papers in the morning. Does the hospital have a cancer ward? Yes, it's on the fifth floor. Why do you ask? No reason. Just curious. Shifting gears, we go to a Geronium battle cruiser orbiting the Earth. A smaller ship is docking with it. Inside the cruiser, we have five Geronians. Each one is at a post on the ship's bridge. Brunam, second in command, is in charge of the bridge. Rofan has returned. Raise shields and re-engage the cloaking device. Rofan enters the bridge, and Brunam greets him. Report. After three cycles, I have confirmed the location of the star fragments. We had these confirmations before. I don't want to contact King Bringin with another false report. Rofan puts his arm around Brunam and shows him the sixth fragment, which is glowing brightly, but not as brightly as it was in the power chamber. Trust me, Captain. This gem has never glowed brighter. But if you are afraid, I will retrieve the other fragments myself. How quickly you forget King Brigand wants that pleasure all to himself, and would surely kill you right where you stand for ever even speaking such treason. <laughs> Why does our mighty king have to come way out here? Perhaps the rumors are true. If the rumors were true, and these fragments were so powerful... Brunam quickly grabs Rofan's hand with the gem in it. Then where is your power? Back at the hospital, Natasha, dressed, sneaks into the hospital elevator. It's just as dim as it was in her dream, and no one is around. There's a clock on the wall. It reads 2.55 a.m. I'm not really sure why I decided to sneak up to the fifth floor in the middle of the night. Natasha enters the elevator. The doors close and the night shift nurse returns to a desk with a cup of coffee. Natasha presses the button to the fifth floor. The door is open, and then Natasha is surprised to see Chris. Jeez, you scared me half to death. I'm oh, sorry about that, Natasha. Natasha exits the elevator and walks with Chris down the hall. How do you know me? I was on my way to see you. I didn't think you were going to show. Come on, let's talk in my room. The order will be back any second. Who are you, and... Chris and Natasha enter the room. She sits in the bed, and Chris closes the door. My name is Chris Hughes. I had a cancerous tumor in my brain. I was brought here for an experimental procedure. The day of my operation, three months ago, there was a huge accident outside the hospital. The survivors were brought here. I know Dr. Precipicus worked on your head to save your life. After the incident, I started to see this little Chinese boy wherever I went. First in my dreams, and then in this room. He told me that he wanted us to meet. Oh my god, you seen him too? At first I thought it was crazy seeing him all over the place, but no one else did. But then the other day during physical therapy, he actually spoke to me. That's when I knew he was a ghost. But then I had this crazy dream where you told me to come here. Yeah, I had the same dream. Well, it felt like a dream. Okay, we met. Now what? I'm not really sure. He told me that you would know what to do. <sighs> Natasha gets up and throws her hands up in the air. Great. That's just great. So you're telling me that some ghost wanted us to meet for some reason? I don't think he's a ghost. Then what is he? Just then, there is an explosion across the street. A body comes crashing through the window and then lands on the bed where Natasha is just sitting, crushing the bed. 
Natasha and Krish are thrown to the floor. They look at the now destroyed bed. The body turns out to be a burnt to a Chris Geronian. What the hell is that? It looks like a body. It's a good thing you moved when you did. Yeah, lucky me. Not too much later, Natasha enters the floor of her apartment for the first time in months. Carrying her mail, she sees a notice on her door. It reads, Dear Mrs. Ash, we have been trying to contact you regarding your past due rent, but please contact us as soon as possible. Management. Natasha opens the door and walks into her apartment. Inside the apartment, Natasha turns on the TV. The same reporter from the accident is on. Live from the Okasa Gallery, where a violent explosion last night took the life of a security guard. Police have yet to find the mysterious red diamond, which has been on display for three months. Foul play is not being ruled out. An interesting side note, this reporter was nearly killed not too far away from the explosion, where one of the city's deadliest multi-car crashes in recent history happened. Many locals are starting to call this area cursed. Join me for a special report on this tonight at 6. Back to you, Jim. Natasha starts to go through her mail, but is interrupted by a bright light coming from her bedroom. She slowly approaches the half-open door. If there's a ghost in there, please don't kill me. She pops her head into the bedroom. Well, it's not a ghost. Natasha sees King Brigand with a sixth fragment in his hand, glowing brighter than ever before, pointing right at Natasha. He is smiling. Lucky me. And that is the conclusion of issue one. We want to thank Hellman Jenny Feldy as Natasha, Jerry Glennon as the alien food talk and roll fan, Patrick Devani as Chris and the alien King Tessa and the father, Raphael Tavares as Precipicus, Julie Kalinske as the reporter and Dr. Rain, Lee Kalinske as the alien King Brigand and Bruno, Riley Kalinske as Ed, and Frank Barber as the musical composer. We want to thank Larry the sound guy. Just letting you know that we do have issue two.